So he said I'd get him back. <laughs> he didn't know this was coming. I didn't know he was doing what he was doing either. So it works really well. Um, the conclusion of last Sunday's service, the cat is gone. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry, wherever he's at, for the release technique, and, and thank you for the, the trap. And yeah, the cat's gone, so we're in good shape for a while. Yes, don't leave the doors open. He wants back really bad. He had it pretty good in here. He was living under the stage. Nobody bothered him. Nobody would dare go under the stage with him. He had his own living space. Most kids don't even have that. But um, the cat is gone, so we're in good shape. Um, is my video ready? Yes. You're going to have to turn it up pretty loud. get started. I'll tell you. I don't know. But it's a tradition. And because of our tradition, every one of us knows who he is and what God expects him to do. <laughs>
Oh my, I heard that already. So I'm going to be a little traditional this morning. Put that down there so I don't drop it. I'm up on top of the, the podium thing. I'm dressed appropriately. I have my suit on. I have my tie on. I do have pants that match. They just don't fit no more. <laughs> I think that's also a tradition. (laughs) So I'm 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 poking fun at this a little bit, but there there's something to be said about tradition. Every tradition has a beginning. Every tradition has a purpose. Um, When I went to church uh, uh, growing up, everybody wore similar attire. It was you you dressed the best you could. And and my mom's here. I'm glad. I'm glad. She gets to, you know why she, she, she wears a dress every Sunday? I'm going to pick it. Sorry, you told me. I, it's, my, it's, my, it's mine now. You know why she wears a dress every Sunday, whether she's at a church or not? She always wanted to give her best to God on Sunday. She wanted to dress her best. Even when they're out on the road driving, my mom and dad were truck drivers. She'd wear a dress on Sunday because she wanted to give the best she had to God. She wanted to make sure one day out of the week for sure, God got the recognition he deserved. And she did that in her wardrobe. Now, she did lots of other things, too. So it's not just that. So let's not get hung up there. So when I, when I, when I was going to church, some of the things that I learned, and I'm going to speak a little quick, and I apologize if I get wound up. I get excited, and I get faster. Devin inherited it. <laughs> True, yes. Um, you could tell what type of service you were having by the way the pastor was dressed. And you knew if it was going to be a good service, all of a sudden buttons started coming loose. And he'd, he'd start getting, and, 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 and this one, this one, oh, this one would come loose. This is when you knew things were going to be good. That would come loose a little bit. And, and as a young person, I'd watch and I'd watch. And, then, and you knew when these things started happening, there were certain signs that were happening. You knew that by the time he was done, there was going to be an altar service. And you knew you were going to get go up there and you're going to get to, you're going to get to meet with Jesus. And when he really got going, the jacket come off. And the sleeves started getting rolled up. You knew that this was going to be a good day. And it usually happened on Sunday nights because Sunday morning you got a good dose of, of, of what we call liturgy or liturgic speaking. We got a good dose of the word to build, to prepare for Sunday night. And Sunday night, this, that was kind of the, the process. And if you knew that was coming, because you'd see that, that guard begin to change, and you're like, oh, this is going to be good. So being a good, a good student of, of that, um, I didn't understand what the tradition was other than you start getting hot when you start speaking. So now I understand why this jacket come loose. It's, oh, it's getting hot in here. You all are comfortable. I'm not. It's getting warmer and warmer. Um, one of the first things I did out of high school, I bought a $600 wool suit. It was a nice suit. It was a good, it was a double-breasted, dark navy, pinstripe suit, had, had matching, the whole thing, and I bought the nice shirt, and I even went out and got floor shine shoes to go with it. Which I can't wear anymore, they squeak. Reet, 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 reet. Uh, only after 20 some years, that's not bad. But I got the good shoes and, and I had this wonderful suit and, 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 and I was proud to wear that suit. It was cool in the summertime because it was wool and it was warm in the winter times. It was a really nice suit. I can't wear it anymore either. <laughs> My son wore it once, but I can't wear it anymore. But that became the expected attire. Now, based on the tradition, when I learned as I grew and as I grew up, I began to understand why that happened. Why I would come to God with the best that I had to offer. And that suit became part of that appearance. I'd make sure I was clean. Oops, sorry, wrong side microphone. Clean shaven and and my hair was combed. And we take great great pride in um, the dippity do. You had to have the right wave. 
in your hair, which doesn't do me any good. It didn't work. Or Dapper Dan, depending on what terminology you use. But Dippity Doo is what we used. You put a little in your comb, you can make your hair stay and everything. Because we wanted to be looking good for God. Now times have changed a little. It probably makes you uncomfortable when I show up in this. I, I see a lot of people going, oh man, he's dressed too nice for this. Okay, so we changed to meet the crowd we're speaking to. That's tradition. Um, the definition of tradition is an inherited, established, or customary pattern of thought, action, or behavior. Inherited is the key word. I didn't understand what it all meant until I got older and started actually listening to what was being said. We just knew Sunday we had to get in nice shoes and we had to wear our Sunday best. But I didn't understand what it meant until I understood the tradition. Other things that we could do. You bring your Bible to church. And it was a competition to me, maybe not to everybody. It was a competition. You had to have the right Bible. You had to have the right case. And in the case, you had to have the right stuff. So that when you open your Bible up, you had, oops, there goes the pen. <clears throat> but you had to have the Bible in there. And, and I was cool. I had the pen and pencil set that stuck to the Bible. Right inside the cover, they were silver. And it was, it was fancy. And then in there, I also, and I, you have to pre, you'd, you'd have your notebook. And you'd have your concords. Now, this is not the one I carried. I failed this morning. I forgot to bring both of mine. I have a Cruden's Concordance. I carried it for years in my Bible. Anybody know what a Cruden's Concordance is? There's a few of you. Good. It was, it, was, it was about the same size as your Bible. Mine was black. And it was a great tool to have around. Because when the pastor was speaking, he would say, well, could somebody find that scripture talking about the money in the fish's mouth? And you go, concordance, poof, here we go. <laughs> Got it. And, it's, and you'd want to be there before anybody else, but you would never open your mouth. You wanted to be at that scripture before I was ready, but you'd never say a word. Because then he would say, well, would somebody read? And the same thing, you'd be, I'm there, okay, I'm there, and it's right there, but I'm not saying a word. <laughs> That's how I learned the books of the Bible. Practice, practice makes perfect. And see, we didn't have tabs. That was cheating. We did not have tabs. That was, that was, that was completely wrong. That was cheating. So traditions have value in a lot of different ways. I almost need a bigger box to work with. So how does this apply to Christmas? How do traditions apply to Christmas? Why do we even celebrate Christmas? What's the purpose? It's up there. It says right there. What does it say? In remembrance of me. Why is that printed there? So remember it. Yeah. Not only is it about communion, but it's about Jesus himself. We celebrate his birth, so we remember about him. We remember the story. We remember the tradition. Because there's value in it. Pardon me if my tie gets a mess. I forgot a tie clip. Tradition. So this morning, um, I want to borrow, who can I borrow? I can't, can I borrow Thomas for a little bit? Gra grab my pen, would you? And you're going to need this. Do you know how to make this thing work? Okay, good. So, because I'm going to do things kind of like I did when I was growing up, some traditions. So I'm going to call out a scripture and I want you to go find it. We're going to start in the book of Luke, so you're going to need one of these. Or something similar. In this day and age, we have technology, so you have the electronic versions. I can remember my first, my first really cool electronic for church. It was a little maroon thing about that big. It was an electronic concordance. And you could type stuff into there, and, and you wouldn't have to look in the book. 
And then poof, there it is, and there's like 15 versions. You scroll through there, there's the one I want. Woohoo! Little, now, now you have a cell phone. You just Google everything. It's easy. So Luke chapter 1. Um, we're going to start reading in the 26th verse. All right, let me get my... And if somebody would get to... A, uh, yeah, who wants to start out with Luke one twenty six? Anybody got that available? Thomas, you're going to go find them. You're going to turn the microphone on so they can hear. We didn't have that microphone thing. And I want you to read the 26th and the 27th verse. Your mamma raised your hand right there. She would. <laughs> In the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay, is there any tradition in that statement? A lot. See, in that time... They didn't necessarily get to pick their husband and wife. We're, we're so much more civilized now. I got to pick Jenny. She got to pick me. There was arrangements made. And they didn't get to pick that. And Joseph, who's Joseph? Technically, the stepdad of Jesus. I think that's the right term. He was there. But... Joseph has a lot more going on. And in the 28th verse, this is where it gets really cool. So the virgin espoused to a man whose Joseph was the line of the house of David. Is that important? It is very important because who's David? David's like the guy. He's the first Jesus, if, if you want to put it that way. David was the king that everybody wanted to be like. He was the Jesus of his time. He was like the guy to be like. The king, everything. David, the house of David, the lineage of David. It's the one to be connected to. And in the 28th verse, it says, The angel came unto the Lord, angel came unto her, and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So Mary's getting this personal, personal conversation with an angel. And it's one-on-one. -on -one. Do guys talk to girls in this time and frame? Do girls ever get any respect in this country, in this culture? Nope. But Mary is getting one-on-one -on -one contact. Breaking traditions. Um, and it continues on. When she saw him, she was scared. It makes sense. 30th verse. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, thou art favored with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in the womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. Not Emmanuel, Jesus. I don't, I don't know why they just had to mess with us there. But Emmanuel's his title. Jesus is his name. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Now she's a spouse to Joseph. Makes sense, right? Everything should be right in line. She's supposed to get married to Joseph of the house of David. Everything's making sense so far. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom shall be, and there shall be no end. Then Mary asks, then said Mary, how shall this be, seeing I have not known a man? Complication. She knows she's marrying Joseph. Kind of makes sense. You know, we can have a kid. It's possible, right? Theoretically, it should be pretty straightforward. And the angel answered. Here, I want someone to read this 35th verse. Luke 135. Anybody got that one? My mic runner's running really well. Very well. And the angel said, 
And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. Now let's break this down into English. Where had Mary heard the term Holy Ghost before? Never. In the Old Testament, the term Holy Spirit, which means the exact same thing other than a couple of simple little things, was only used three times in conjunction together. So this Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost was a whole new word. We know it today. We kind of expect it today. The Holy Ghost is kind of what we, we function, everything based on the Holy Ghost and the functioning of that. But Mary didn't know what that was. And, and in the writings, it's, it's written um, ghost being breath or spirit, being awful thing, not awful as in bad, awe as in awful thing, an amazing thing, or a sacred and pure, most holy thing. And the holy, holy was, was used multiple times, um, referencing basically greatness of God. So the, the term Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit was not used. It was used in Psalm 51 with David, when David says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And then it was used in Isaiah. 63. Um, but it wasn't a common phrase. So Mary is getting some new information. Very new information. This has now changed the table from, ah, Joseph will have a kid. Now, wait a minute. What are you saying again? The Holy Ghost is going to come upon me and I'm going to conceive a child. How is that possible? How is it even probable? How does that even work? And then Mary was no fool either. Because part of culture, she had heard scripture. She knew the prophecies. She knew about the Messiah. She knew about all these things. It's not new. It had been prophesied for how many hundreds of years before? At least 500. they have been talking the prophecy of the Messiah. And it's over and over and over and over again. And you can't get away from the concept that they knew about Isaiah. They knew about Isaiah's prophecy. And what did Isaiah say was going to happen? A virgin's going to give birth. Now picture this. Try to put yourself in, your, in her shoes if you can for a moment. Traditionally, an angel shouldn't be talking to me. Traditionally, this is impossible. But traditionally, there's, wait a minute. This is changing the game a little. This becomes something so much greater. And it continues on. And by the way, I'm reading out of King James Version if that has any variance on, because it's traditional or something. Okay, the Holy Ghost, 36th verse, and behold, the, your cousin, Elizabeth, she also has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called a barren. So the Holy Spirit, or the angel, saying, by the way, you need proof to believe this is true? Check this out. Here's a way to verify this information, that you are speaking to Gabriel. You are speaking, you are being touched by the Holy Spirit. 37th verse, who wants to run that one? Oh, good. You're a perfect person to run this one. For nothing is impossible with my God. <laughs> and God's working in your life. I'm worth it grateful. Nothing is impossible with God. Not some things are, nothing is impossible with God. That's an amazing story. And she's not just hearing it from somebody. She's hearing it from an angel. 
which most of us can play off. Maybe it was, I don't know, bad sausage. I don't know, had a weird dream. But there's this other thing in there that says, go talk to Elizabeth. Because I tell you, she's six months into her term. So what do you think Mary's going to do? Well, maybe I'll go see Elizabeth. Nah, that's a long trip. I don't feel up to it. I bet money, it's not in scripture, but I bet money she hot-footed as quick as she could to go see Elizabeth because she wanted the verification of the story. She wanted to believe that what she believed was real and that that angel was there. And it's not just a dream, it's real. As we're putting it to the test. Nothing is impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be unto me according to thy word. Acceptance. She could have said, Nope, 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 not going to happen. Not today, angel. Probably wouldn't have worked well for her. But she said, Okay. That's the way it is. I am good with it. And the angel departed from her. Now let's go back to tradition. This is a mother with a child and no husband. What does tradition say should happen to this person? Stoned. Now she's in trouble. So she is now sacrificing her life, accepting this call, accepting this child. She is sacrificing her life. She's saying, okay, God, you got this. I know the rules. As soon as they find out, I'm, I'm dead. As soon as everybody finds out, I'm done. I know the rules. I know the traditions. I'm done. But... She says, okay, if that's the way it is. She had to go back to the statement, I'm sure, back in 37 that says, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. You can spare my life. You can protect me. Now, I have no idea what this angel looks like. I wasn't there. There's no real good descriptor there. But it talks about Gabriel, the archangel. So I'm assuming this isn't just like one of the peon angels the little guys I just show up every once in a while hey what's up this is the guy this is the angel I imagine in my mind and this is how I process data I imagine this authoritative figure massive figure the scripture talks about angels they're shining they're bright it talks about the warring angels and it talks about wrestling and, and these, just this massive being standing before me And the first thing you're going to do is go, oh, oh, sorry. But at the same time, she's recognizing that that angel also can protect her. (laughs) There's a lot of stuff going on here that breaks away from tradition and begins a new one that we celebrate today. Okay, so she heads off towards Elizabeth. Um, Somebody get to the 41st verse, please. And I'll read up until we get there. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Okay. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah. She didn't lollygag. She went with haste. And entered entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Saluted. I can't even say it. She gave salutations. Go ahead. And when it came about, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Ooh, wait a minute. I thought it wasn't supposed to happen until after Jesus that you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Huh. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Imagine her excitement. 
because she's going through her own struggles. She was going through the whole, I was barren, now I have a child, and this child's supposed to be a prophet of God, and this child's supposed to do all this stuff, and he has a name even. It's supposed to be given the name John, and my husband can't talk, and it's quite annoying. Actually, sometimes that's good, but... She's going through her own series of troubles and then here comes the Holy Spirit when Mary shows up and the baby inside of her jumps just at her presence and the Holy Spirit, the encourager, the comforter. Wait a minute, that's not supposed to happen until after Jesus. Huh. Jesus was there. Problem solved. The comforter was there. And she needed that. Trying not to get off track. Trying. But it's not fun. The story continues on. And they have a conversation. And then Mary ends this conversation. Somebody go to the 48th verse. Elizabeth continues and spoke out in a loud voice, not a calm voice, and said, Blessed art thou among women, and be blessed, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence it has come to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me. She had recognition already. For lo, as soon as the voice of the salutation sounded in my womb, my ears, the babe leaped in my womb. And blessed is she that believed Ooh. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Elizabeth and Mary hadn't had conversation yet. But already backing up the story. Thanks to the Holy Spirit. My soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in the Savior. All right, the 48. Good thing he can run fast sometimes. For he has, my bifocals, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time, all the generations will count me blessed. Mary's saying this, right? From here on out, all generations are going to recognize me as blessed. Do you think she had a clue what was going on? She did. She did. She knew something big was happening. She knew she had the Messiah. Now, for you ladies that have had children, imagine the panic. Oh, this might be, oh, this is God's baby. What am I going to eat? Where's my prenatal vitamins? How do I walk? I don't want to risk this baby for nothing. This is God's baby. This is like the package that's going to save the world. This is the Messiah. A whole new layer of complexity. Then there's poor Joseph. What? Okay. Um, Now how do I do this? Because, you know, this is going to be the son of God. I have to raise this. Um, This is going to get complicated really quickly. And do do I even accept this as true? That this, this, this is the, I probably haven't even hardly met her yet. This is my espoused wife, and she's got a child on the way. But, but God, greatest term in the Bible, or not in the Bible, greatest term, period. But God met Joseph in a dream and said, guess what? Take her. The child is mine. Take her and keep her as your own. The child is mine. And in that dream, in that moment, Joseph felt, and I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here. He felt the Holy Spirit witness to him that he knew this was the right thing 
and that this was Jesus the Messiah and that Mary was telling the absolute truth. Talk about a relationship building tool. Completely against culture and tradition. But Mary knows all generations are going to be calling me blessed. Now in the book of Isaiah chapter 7, where he gets his name, or his title, I'm sorry, his title. Follow along with me. Or if you want to find it, go for it. It's a good, it's a good verse of scripture to remember. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. I'm borrowing it from Pastor Bob Hughes it last week because there is no plan B. This was it. This was the plan. And Isaiah was around how long before all this happened? Five, six, seven hundred years before this. It's the time of Isaiah. And he's prophesying a virgin's going to give birth to the Son of God, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. His title. And that's not the only time. You go into chapter 9 and it continues to talk about, Isaiah talked about the Messiah quite a bit, 9, 6. For unto you a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hmm. Now, Mary knows this. Mary knows the scripture. She knows the babies that she's carrying is going to be called. The government's going to be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. She knows that's the titles he's going to get. No added stress there. Not at all. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth. Even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God's going to do it. It said so. And she knew that. She'd heard the story. She'd been around it. Now picture this. So she's getting along in the process and Joseph gets the call. Ding, 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 ding. You need to go to Bethlehem, buddy. It's that time of year. You got to go check in, do your taxation and all your stuff. Now picture this. What else, what other scripture does Mary know that might be important at this point in time? Micah. Micah chapter 5. You want to find it? Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou art little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me. That is to be the ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. She knew the Messiah was going to come out of Bethlehem. Road trip, going to Bethlehem. And the time came in Bethlehem. All of these prophecies, all of these traditions, all of these stories she were told, all of that stuff was put into place so that when the moment came and Bethlehem was there and the baby was born in a stable, in a manger, lowly in a place where nobody cared. All of that was already built into place and she knew it. And every single step of the way it was verification, as it were, that this is the guy, this is the time, this is the one over and over and over again. And now, once the baby's born, the fun begins. 
Once they're outside, they're harder to contain. As they grow, they get more and more fun. You get to chase them. Can you imagine, well, how do you put this? Can you imagine um, Jesus' first diaper? Do you think it was like your first diaper? Most likely. And guess who had to clean it? Mary had to clean it up. (laughs) But if you didn't have the first diaper, you'd blow up. But Jesus had to be like us. He had to go through all the same things. Can you imagine potty training Jesus? Oh. Or toilet training, let's use the proper term, sorry. Toilet training Jesus? Do you think it was like, Jesus is done, woo, good to go? Or do you think it was like the rest of us? I'll give you a thucker. Come on, poop in the body. Do you think any of that actually occurred? Yes, absolutely, every bit of it was the same. But Jesus knew in her heart, and Jesus knew, or sorry, Mary, wrong name, let me back up. Mary knew in her heart, and Mary knew in her mind, and Mary knew the stories, and Mary knew the prophecy that was over her son. Mary knew it, and Mary knew that her son Jesus was the Savior that we'd all been hoping for. And yes, when Jesus touched what he wasn't supposed to touch, he got his hand slapped. In my house, it was the spoon. I don't know if he was like, Tyler, you're in trouble. Go get the spoon. Just spank me and get it over with. I don't know if he was that way or not. I really don't. But you know, part of me has to say there was part of him that was because he was just like you and me. With a little something extra special. He was the son of the king, the son of God. But he had to go through all the same processes and all the same stuff. You know, as Joseph's leaving Bethlehem with his baby and his wife going to Egypt, why did he do that? Angel said so, number one. Number two, in this book, in these stories, His son had to be taken out of Egypt to fulfill. So all of these things that were put into place were put into place so perfectly and amazingly that God had it all planned out. There was no plan B. There was no option B. There was no, well, maybe this Jesus ain't the right Jesus. Maybe this Mary ain't the right, pardon me, that's bad English. I am so sorry. Maybe this isn't the right Mary. Maybe this isn't the right time. It was absolutely perfect. Every bit of it. So that we could come today and we could celebrate the tradition of the birth of a baby that saved all of humanity. So that we could have a relationship with the Father. And it was all planned out so well. There's a story I heard. Um, A man looked at his watch. It was a Timex Indigo. They're nice watches. I used to have one. Play with the light all the time. And the story goes, he says, if I took this watch apart and I threw it in a bag and I began to shake it, And I shaked it for six million years because, you know, out of chaos comes order. And I opened that bag after six million years. I don't think I'd have a watch because everything was planned and orchestrated in ways. You can't have six million years of chaos and nothing. All of a sudden, something. There's a plan. The Emmanuel plan is Pastor Bob. Oh, That just excites me because that means that everything we're doing, everything we're working towards, everything we're striving to accomplish, every prayer we pray, every breath we breathe, every scripture we study has a purpose. And God knows it. And we're part of it. 
We're part of that purpose. We celebrate the tradition of Christmas to make sure we remember that there was a virgin that gave birth as per scripture, as per the stories, not just some supernatural thing that just happened out of, no, it was real. And we honor the tradition to make sure we keep it real and keep it in our minds. The greatest thing that could ever happen, happened. And we get to reap the benefits. In life grand? We get to reap the benefits of a baby that was born of a virgin in the town of Bethlehem as predicted by a lowly prophet, Micah. Wow. That's just amazing. So this morning, yes, traditions can be made fun of. Yes, traditions are valuable. But understanding the origin of the tradition, tradition, where it came from, that makes the difference. Understanding that if I dress this way before God, it's in honor of God, not of me. It's a it's a privilege. I'm not saying to go out and buy a suit. Don't get me there, please. No, no. It's hot. It's uncomfortable. The tie gets tight. It's just not. But growing up and knowing that this tradition of putting on a suit and a tie to bring your best to God at least one day a week. At least one. We got three times a week because we got Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. We had that tradition of bringing the best you had before God is valuable. And it's not about the clothes. It's about the heart. It's about bringing the best you have of your heart to God. Every chance you can. Um, And that's the end of my notes. It was easy. It was only like a page and a half. This morning, I, I want you to Consider your traditions, where they came from. I want to consider this remembrance. Because we have the opportunity to celebrate one of the greatest things that ever happened. Even creation was kind of boring, really. Just, there it is. All the creation was done at once. It doesn't grow. You don't continue to create. Creation was creation. Creation was done. But this, this, the introduction of Jesus, the introduction of his son into the world has continually caused change over and over and over again. And it continually is changing people's lives. It's continually making a difference in people's lives. And it's continuing to grow and grow and grow and continuing to do something. Creation is kind of boring because once it's done, it's done. But this is never done. The Jesus that died is never done. The baby that was born is never done. That's the amazing thing of God is it's never done. So this morning, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the traditions of old. Thank you for those things that were instilled into our lives that we could understand the value of you. We thank you for telling us the story so that we can remember your son, the miraculous birth of Jesus, born of a virgin in the town of Bethlehem. God, I thank you for all that you're doing and all that you've done. May this time of year we refresh our traditions of you. In Jesus' name, amen.